the diet of whole food, plant-based diets, and how that can protect against um, heart cardiac disease or make our heart attack proof, but also considering how we can um, reverse what's already there, right? So please join me, give a brain injury welcome, and please uh, hold your questions to the end of the presentation. Uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Kagwa. This, uh, really, this exciting group, uh, a little bit of my research and clinical strategies, to make, really to make yourself heart attack proof. Uh, the truth be known, <clears throat> coronary artery heart disease is nothing more than a toothless paper tiger that need never ever exist. And if it does exist, it need never ever progress. This is a benign foodborne illness. The thing that's a little bit embarrassing for the medical profession is that we have known for over a hundred years that there are multiple cultures on the planet Earth where cardiovascular disease is virtually non-existent. Uh, if you, for example, if you were to take your cardiac surgery shingle and decide to hang out in Okinawa, rural China, the Papua Highlanders, Central Africa, or the Tarahumara Indians in Northern Mexico, you can forget it. You aren't gonna have any surgery. They, all, they don't have heart disease, why? Because they're all thriving on whole food, plant-based nutrition. But sadly, why haven't we in the profession taken that to the public and taught them how they can eat so they never have to have this disease? Now, and? And that's, I'm not getting, there it goes. Uh, this is the oldest slide in my presentation. And I took this in 1968 when I was leaving Vietnam, having spent a year there as a combat surgeon. And the reason I show this slide is it's to remind me to tell the audience that <clears throat> when we autopsy our young GIs who die uh, in combat, Roughly 80% of those average 20 year olds already have gross evidence of coronary artery disease that you can see without a microscope. Not enough for their cardiac events yet, but here in that young age, we already have it starting. So that same study was repeated 45 years later in 1999, this time looking at young women and men who have died of accidents, homicides, and suicides between the ages of 17 and 34. Lo and behold, now the disease is ubiquitous. Everybody in that age group already has early coronary artery disease. You graduate from high school in this country, you get a diploma. And you also get the foundation for heart disease. That is to say, they continue to eat the same way until now we're in their 40s and 50s, and that's why we have this tsunami of cardiovascular disease in this, in this country. Now here we had a chance to actually get it right if we had had our thinking cap on. In World War II, it was common that the, uh, the Axis powers of Germany overran the low countries of Holland and Belgium and they occupied Denmark and Norway. And it was characteristic of the uh, Germans that they took away their livestock. So these countries were without their, cat, their cattle, their sheep, their goats, their pigs, their chickens, their turkeys, now they were gone. And suddenly they were now thriving on whole food plant-based nutrition in these Western European countries. And it was doctors Strom and Janssen in 1951, reporting in England's leading medical journal, they looked at the death in Nor the deaths in Norway from heart attack and stroke during this period. And let's just look at that together. Now you see, starting on the left in 1927, deaths from heart attack and stroke were going up. <clears throat> 1930, going up. 1935, going up. 1939, in come the Germans. Whoop, down go the deaths in 41. Down go the deaths in 42. Who
who knew these Germans were these great public health educators? But look what happened in 1945 with the death of Adolf Hitler and the cessation of hostilities in the European theater. Immediately back comes the meat, back comes the dairy, back come the strokes, and back come the heart attacks. <clears throat> I'm going to ask at this moment, are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. All right. Now, the plot thickens. Yes, you are looking at two arteries. The one on the left is normal. The one on the right is thoroughly diseased. And you're probably saying, when that opening, that small opening on the one on the right, when that closes off, there'll probably be a heart attack. But actually, not so. Sure enough, anything that is this disease is going to give you chest pain, perhaps shortness of breath. But a heart attack, unlikely, maybe about a 10% of heart attacks occur with something like this. Why? Because for this to develop, this has taken decades to get to this point. And as it is slowly, slowly, gradually encroaching and making that opening smaller and smaller, the downstream heart muscle recognizes that it is being deprived of its usual amount of blood and it will form its own by bypass. That is to say, when you do an angiogram and you look at the dye flowing through the blood vessel, you will see tiny little threads of vessels that the body has formed that go around this blockage. We call those collaterals. They are not enough to obviously restore normal flow, but they are enough to sustain the downstream heart muscle viability, even when that small opening closes off. But now we wanna look at the artery on the left. And what I want you to notice there is that little tiny dark line that is in the innermost part of that artery. That is a, the one, one of two words that I want you to remember from this presentation today. That, is called the endothelium. The endothelium is that magic lining that covers the inside of our blood vessels and it has a remarkable function of manufacturing a truly remarkable molecule that we call nitric oxide, a gas. Now, the first thing that happens when you start eating that pizza the milkshake, the cheeseburger. If we look <clears throat> at the figure on the left, all those cellular elements now begin to get sticky, sticky, sticky. The endothelium gets sticky. Your platelets, which are your clotting factor, get sticky. Your bad LDL cholesterol gets sticky, sticky, sticky. Now we're gonna go on to a drawing by Peter Libby of Harvard. Just to orient you on this, the blood is flowing through the blue area and separating the blue area from the wall of the artery. You look at the top, there goes a little line of single layer cells that line that wall of the artery, which we just mentioned are called the endothelium. Now to make some sense out of this together, let's do this. Let's focus on the upper left, where in the blood you can see floating that LDL cholesterol molecule, which is now sticky because of the cheeseburger and milkshakes you've been eating. So those sticky LDL cholesterol molecules are going to bump up against those purple single layer cells of the endothelium. They are going to find a crack, a fissure, an opening, and they're going to migrate into the left excuse me, into the subendothelial space. And once they're in the subendothelial space, they become oxidized by these free radicals that are come from our food. And here, Peter Libby of Harvard has taken the LDL cholesterol molecule and it is no longer painted orange. He now begins to paint it yellow to represent the fact that it is now a small, hard, dense LDL cholesterol molecule that has been oxidized. Now, your subendothelial space does not like those 
small, hard, dense LDL cholesterol particles. And it sends that blue SWAT team across from the blood into the subendothelial space where it behaves like Pac-Man, gobbling up, gobbling up, gobbling up all these small, hard, dense LDL particles as we go from left to right. When we get all the way to the right, we in medicine do what we do so often, we change the name so that that SWAT team molecule that is now chock full of these small, hard, dense LDL particles is now called the foam cell. Now, the foam cell is truly the Darth Vader of this sequence of events. Why? Because it is the foam cell that manufactures these nasty, nasty metalloproteinases like stromelicin, elastase, collagenase, and myeloperoxidase. And this is about as tough as it's going to get for you. I promise we'll keep the words in a vocabulary that you can grab your arms around. But the metalloproteinases that are produced by the foam cell progressively thin out the cap over the plaque. And you can see on the figure on the left, if you look at the top of the cap on the plaque, you can see that little crack. Now that is an absolute seminal moment in the progress of this disease. Because when you have ruptured your plaque, you now have the extravasation, or shall we say the oozing out of, if you will, of plaque content into the flowing blood, where it now activates our platelets, excuse me, our platelets, and we, <coughs> we go to the middle figure, B. And now we see a clot forming where we, ha where we had that rupture in the, in the uh, plaque, and that clot is in and of itself self-propagating. So in a matter of further minutes, we're now all the way over to the figure on the right, where the clot is now so extensive, it is completely blocked 100% the artery. There is no time over months and months and years for collaterals to develop. So suddenly, with this arrangement, all the downstream heart muscle from this blood vessel is suddenly denied deprived of all of its oxygen and nutrients, and it starts to die, and that's 90%, 90% of your uh, heart attacks. Now, if I do my job correctly today, every one of you, and hopefully your friends or relatives, can make themselves heart attack proof. How are we gonna do that? Well, we're not gonna do it with a pill. We're not gonna do it with a stent. We're not gonna do it with bypass surgery. We're going to do it by changing your biochemistry. How are you going to do that? We're going to change your biochemistry by changing your food. And <clears throat> when that happens, you're going to make yourself heart attack proof because you're not all of those cascade of events that I've just described to you previously. You're not going to have the LDL cholesterol migrating into the subendothelial space. There will be no Pac-Man there will, that is to say, there will be a no, uh, none of those uh, SWAT team will not be necessary. You will not form the foam cell, the Darth Vader of this sequence of events. You will not thin out the cap over your plaque. As a matter of fact, you will strengthen the cap over your plaque. And if you strengthen the cap over your plaque, it cannot rupture. If you cannot rupture your plaque, you will have made yourself heart attack proof. We think this takes about three weeks to do this. All right, very good. Now you can ignore the x-ray here, but I want you to focus. This is the artist who drew this yes, art. Yes, Lucy. Yeah. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I, uh, did somebody? I want to open it, that's okay. <laughs> I'm all down, bro. You know, I don't know what happened to, to the audio, but I, I think somebody asked me something and I couldn't understand them. Oh, no, I was, excuse me, sorry. It was just uh, so, someone was unmuted. So, yeah, continue. Continue? Fair enough. So you're looking, you. at the, the, you're looking at the open end of an artery where the artist has shown it that half of the artery is filled with plaque 
and the left-hand side of it is still open. And you can see in the open part on the left-hand side, again, you can see they're painted white here, those, that single layer of endothelial cells that lines the uh, artery. Well, it was up until about 1980 that we in medicine used to think that those endothelial cells were simply uh, sort of like cute little red bricks that were lining our wonderful pipes. That all changed in 1980 when Dr. Fershkot, working in his laboratory in Brooklyn, was taking the largest blood vessel in the rodent, that is to say the aorta, and he would make these sort of this elliptical spiral staircase cut on the rat's aorta. He would immerse it in a bath of saline and it would constrict. But one day he did this without any cut, with no injury to the endothelial cell. He immersed it and it dilated. He did it with another. It dilated. Now suddenly, globally, the race was on. What was the EDRF that Dr. Prescott had demonstrated. That is to say, what is the endothelial derived relaxation factor? Thank heavens that term was with us only eight years because at the end of eight years, Dr. Fershkot, Dr. Murad, Dr. Lewignero discovered that the EDRF that the endothelial cells were make, making in Dr. Fershkot lab was a gas and that gas is nitric oxide. Now, nitric oxide has a number of remarkable functions, so much so that those three men, Dr. Murad, Dr. Fershkot, Dr. Ignaro, in 1998 received the Nobel Prize for discovering nitric oxide. Now, what is it about nitric oxide that makes it worthy of a Nobel Prize. Well, I'm gonna give you an example now of several of its important functions. One, nitric oxide will keep all the cellular elements within our bloodstream flowing smoothly like Teflon rather than Velcro. It keeps things from getting sticky. Number two, nitric oxide is the strongest blood vessel dilator in the body. When you climb stairs, the arteries to your heart, the arteries to your legs, they widen. They dilate, that's nitric oxide. Number three, nitric oxide will protect the wall of the artery from becoming stiff and thick or inflamed and protect us from getting high blood pressure or hypertension. Number four is the absolute key. A safe and normal amount of nitric oxide will protect us all from ever developing any blockages or plaques. So literally, everybody on the planet Earth who has cardiovascular disease, has their disease because in the previous decades, they have so sufficiently trashed, injured, compromised, and turned their endothelial system into an absolute train wreck that they no longer have enough nitric oxide to protect themselves from making blockages or plaque. Now, the good news is this. This is not a malignancy. It is a benign foodborne illness. And once you can get patients to understand that never, ever, ever again are they to pass through their lips a single morsel that is going to further injure an already train wrecked endothelium because then the endothelium will recover, make enough nitric oxide so we can halt any disease progression. And we often see significant examples of disease reversal. Now, what are the foods that every time they pass our lips, we injure the endothelial cells? They are, number one, any drop of oil. Olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, coconut oil, palm oil, oil in a cracker, oil in a piece of bread, oil in a salad dressing. Oil will injure the endothelial cells, as does Anything with a mother or a face, meat, fish, chicken, fowl, turkey, and eggs. Also, anything that is dairy, milk, cream, butter, cheese, ice cream, and yogurt. And we don't like sugary drinks, diet colas, 
Pepsi and Coke, and sugar injures endothelial cells. So we avoid sugary foods such as cakes, pies, cookies, stevia, agave, excesses of maple syrup, molasses, and honey. For my patients with serious heart disease, I do not like them to have nuts, peanut butter, nut butters, cashew sauce, or avocado, and avoid coffee with caffeine. Decaf, okay. Coffee with caffeine injures endothelial cells. Now, what are you going to eat? You're going to eat all these marvelous whole grains for your cereal, bread, pasta, rolls, and bagels, 101 different types of legumes, lentils, and beans, all these marvelous red, yellow, and green leafy vegetables, and white potatoes, sweet potatoes, and some fruit. And there are many delicious recipes in some of the books that my wife and my daughter, or my own book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, or books by Neil Barnard or, or uh, <clears throat> John McDougall are also, uh, have, so you have hundreds of wonderful recipes uh, available. You know, and it's interesting uh, when people say, and the first thing they're going to say is, well, where do I get my protein? Nothing is further from the truth. Uh, there is protein in grain. There is protein in all kinds of legumes and beans. Protein throughout vegetables. Protein in potatoes. Uh, matter of fact, it's fascinating. In, in just in the last decade or so, you're seeing increasingly professional sports teams uh, take up plant-based nutrition because they have much greater, greater stamina and a quicker recovery time. Now, the second uh, thing that happens probably is a number of you are probably wondering, gosh, I wonder what my nitric oxide level is. Well, we don't have a way of really measuring that in the office, but I will share with you. In a research setting, what is done is you take an ultrasound probe and you place it over the brachial artery uh, at the uh, elbow. And then you've got to read out what is the amount of dilatation, dilating, widening uh, of that brachial artery, the width of it. Then for five minutes, you encircle the upper arm with a blood pressure cuff that you inflate above uh, systolic blood pressure. That means for five minutes, you have zero blood flow to your forearm and hand. Then you release the cuff and immediately take the ultrasound probe and like, once again measure the diameter of the brachial artery after they... Uh, tourniquet has been removed. In the normal patient, it'll be 30% wider now after that tourniquet has been removed because of the tremendous outpouring of nitric oxide from those endothelial cells during the period when that uh, uh, artery was occluded. Now, the next uh, interesting uh, thing that happened was Dr. Uh, uh, Robert Vogel, chairman of cardiology at the uh, University of Maryland, took a group of healthy young subjects to a certain fast food restaurant, which is characterized by arches, which are golden. Half of them got the uh, cornflakes. Then they had the brachial artery tourniquet test measured, normal. The other half that had the hash browns and sausage, within 120 minutes after that meal, when they measured the brachial artery tourniquet test, they were unable to dilate the artery. That single meal of hash browns and sausage had so trashed, so injured, so compromised the ability of their endothelial cells to make nitric oxide, they simply couldn't dilate the artery. However, as they followed them into the late afternoon and early evening, they somewhat began to recover. But you and I know that the next Morning for breakfast, it'll probably be bacon, eggs, <laughs> bacon and eggs and scrambled eggs. And also lunchtime, it might be white bread with mayonnaise and cold cuts. And at supper time, it might be a baked potato with sour cream, vegetables soaked in butter, lamb chops, ranch dressing on a salad, and ice cream for dessert. Here in the good old USA, we start as kids, Day, all day long, trashing and injuring our endothelial cells' ability to make nitric oxide. And it's no great mystery why we have this tsunami of vascular disease. So summarizing what you've just learned about nitric oxide. Remember, the two words I want you to know, 
the endothelial cells and nitric oxide. What does nitric oxide do? We just talked about it. Prevents stickiness, strongest blood vessel dilator, avoids arterial thickening, prevents blockages. And actually it can uh, prevent smooth muscle migration from growing into the wall of the artery. And above all, above all it destroys foam cell. That is the, the Darth Vader. Now, this is a list of really four wonderful defense mechanisms in the body. We only have time truly to vote today to talk about the endothelial cell. But let me just reassure you that all of these, the endothelial cell plus the other three, all of their functions are enhanced and improved when you're eating whole food, plant-based nutrition. Now let's go to where the rubber meets the road. This is the first uh, study that I did uh, on patients who are seriously ill with cardiovascular disease. 23 men, one woman, they all had severe triple vessel disease. I had nothing against women. This is just the way the patients were sent to me. It was a small study because I was still actively involved as a surgeon at that time with my surgical responsibilities. My, uh, I guess my greatest fear in this stu uh, study was whether the patients would comply with a, a, a diet that was so, uh, uh, so, was so significantly different from what they had been used to. And so to see if I could get them to adhere, I used the same mantra that I uh, had used for my cancer patients that I had uh, learned from a West Coast surgeon years ago by the name of Bert Dunphy. And Bert used to say that patients with cancer are not afraid to suffer. Patients with cancer are not afraid to die. But patients with cancer are afraid of being <clears throat> abandoned by their family or by their physician. So for the first five years, I saw every one of these patients, every, <clears throat> uh, Every, every week, every, excuse me, every two weeks. And at the end of five years, uh, I got a little bit more courageous and I began seeing them uh, once a month. Most cardiologists see their patients uh, twice a year. And at the end of a decade, now they were pretty well on autopilot. So I stretched it out to see them quarterly. And then at 12 years, we wrote up, wrote, wrote up the experience we had with these patients and published it in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. And <clears throat> the fact that it was for 12 years makes it probably one of the longest, if not the longest study of its type. 12 years was almost, almost half a career. Now, what we want them to be sure to avoid. Remember, not a drop of oil, all right? not a drop of oil, olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, coconut oil, palm oil, oil in a cracker, oil in a piece of bread, and nothing that as a mother or a face, no meat, fish, fowl, chicken, or eggs. We want to avoid dairy, milk, cream, butter, cheese, ice cream, and yogurt. We do not like coffee with caffeine, and we want to avoid uh, sugar. Now, <clears throat> for some of you, maybe you are doubtful about what I just said, <clears throat> about oil. Here is a peer-reviewed scientific study. Olive, soybean, and palm oil intake have a similar acute detrimental effect over the endothelial function in healthy young subjects. All right. Now, this is some work with Stanley Hazen that is kind of interesting. And as you can see listed on this slide are all animal foods. So those are what omnivores are eating. What Stan Hazen did was he actually found out that when lecithin and carnitine, which are molecules that are found in these animal foods, people who are omnivores possess in their gut, in their microbiome, in their intestine, they possess bacteria that can metabolize lecithin and carnitine contained in these animal products into a molecule called TMA, trimethylamine, which is rapidly oxidized in your liver to trimethylamine oxide. 
And he found that trimethylamine oxide was injurious to our blood vessels. So let me show you the schematic here. Persons who eat animal foods are eating lecithin and carnitine. When they eat it and those molecules arrive at their gut, they have bacteria, that is the omnivore does, have bacteria that will metabolize lecithin and carnitine into trimethylamine oxide, which leads to vascular disease. But the striking thing that Stan Hazen discovered was that persons who are totally 100% plant-based, if he gave them a lamp shop and then measured their blood, there was no TMAO. Persons who are 100% plant-based do not possess in their gut, in their microbiome, they do not possess bacteria that will metabolize less than in carnitine into TMAO. Another wonderful reason to be plant-based. Now, I'm gonna give you one slide break from cardiovascular disease because this is a historic moment, October of 2015, when the World Health Organization collectively, think of it, representatives from countries throughout the planet all came together and agreed that processed red meat had the same level of carcinogenicity as smoking cigarettes. All right, now, remember, we talked about what you're gonna eat. You're gonna eat all those whole grains for your pasta, bread, rolls, and bagels, 101 different types of legumes and lentils, all those marvelous red, yellow, and green leafy vegetables, and uh, some fruit. Now, I have to take a, a, a moment here to mention that what we have ch changed in the last 10 years in our program relates to the fact that <clears throat> the nitric oxide production of from the endothelial cell is age dependent. By that, I mean, you never heard of a boy or girl at age eight having a heart attack. They have nitric oxide coming out of their ears. But by the time you're 50, even if you're beautifully healthy, you now have 50% of the nitric oxide that you had when you were age 25. And by the time you're 80, you've lost 70%. So what we did 10 years ago, we modified the program for greater stimulation of the endothelial cells to have more output of nitric oxide. And at the same time, we took advantage of the newer research in the last 12 years or so that shows us that mankind has an alternate pathway for making this wonderful molecule of nitric oxide, which I'm gonna share with you now. For my patients who have serious heart disease, I ask them now to chew, not smoothies, not juicing. I want them to chew a green leafy vegetable at least six times a day, uh, roughly the size of half of your fist. After it has first been boiled in water, five and a half to six minutes or steamed, so it's nice and tender. And then you must anoint it with several drops of a delightful rice or balsamic vinegar. Why? because research has shown us that the acetic acid from those vinegars can restore the nitric oxide synthase enzyme, which is responsible for making nitric oxide. So you're gonna chew this alongside your breakfast cereal, again, as a mid-morning snack, again, with your lunch and sandwich, that's three, mid-afternoon, four, dinner time, five, and of course, I adore it, when you have that evening snack of kale. Now, what's the second benefit from chewing the greens? Chewing the greens restores the capacity of your bone marrow to once again make the endothelial progenitor cell. What does the endothelial progenitor cell do? It replaces our senescent, injured, worn out endothelial cells. What about <clears throat> the third benefit from chewing the green leafy vegetable? And this is the most important of all. When you are chewing a green leafy vegetable, you are chewing a green nitrate. As you chew this green nitrate, it is going to mix. 
It's going to mix with the facultative anaerobic bacteria that reside in the crypts and grooves of your tongue. Those bacteria are going to reduce the green nitrate that you're chewing to a nitrite. When you swallow the nitrite, it is your own gastric acid, which is going to further reduce the nitrite to more nitric oxide, which can now enter your nitric oxide pool. So think about it. With minimal expense, with no side effects, what you were doing, literally, all day long, dawn to dusk, morning to night, you were absolutely restoring nitric oxide, the very molecule, the deficiency of which gave you this disease in the first place. Now there's a caveat to this. Toothpaste with fluoride, public drinking water with fluoride, and mouthwash will injure the beneficial bacteria in your mouth. And I do not like, I do not like antacids. Why? Because antacids will reduce your gastric acidity and you will be unable to reduce the nitrite to more nitric oxide. All right. Now, I want to share with you, oh, this is <laughs> no oil. I want to share with you now a few angiograms reflecting disease reversal. These angiograms were all reviewed in triplicate in the Cleveland Clinic Angiography Core Laboratory by senior technicians that do this all day long for national medical trials. So when I give you a percentage of reversal, I know that it's accurate. This happens to be the left anterior descending coronary artery in a 67 year old retired pediatrician. And from the arrow on the left to the arrow on the right, it was described as a 10% improvement. Now, this is as small as you can see with the naked eye. It's a little easier if you look at this next one in a 58-year-old factory worker, where you're looking at the circumflex artery that goes to the back of the heart. And the improvement here from the left arrow to the right arrow was described as 20%. Now, this is a 54-year-old security guard, and this is the right coronary artery. And from the arrow on the left to the arrow on the right, this improvement was described as 30%. Well, this, on the other hand, happens to be a good surgical colleague and friend of mine, Joe Crow. And in 1996, 1996 at age 44, Dr. Crow began uh, to get chest discomfort. And he had a cholesterol of 156. Uh, he was not diabetic. He was not a smoker. He was not hypertensive. And he... Uh, uh, and so he then uh, was evaluated by cardiology and cardiology uh, happened to uh, find nothing. That was in October of 96. A month later, he finished his surgical schedule and sat down to write post-operative orders when suddenly he felt the elephant sitting on his chest, pain in his left jaw, shoulder, arm. He was having a heart attack. He was whipped down to the catheterization laboratory. They start the catheterization. He had a cardiac arrest. They resuscitated him, finished the catheterization. One more cardiac arrest, resuscitated, stabilized, sent up to the floors. And three days later, he was discharged, but he was very depressed. He was depressed when he was discharged because at the time of his catheterization, they found that uh, you can see by this yellow bracket, that the lower one third of the left anterior descending coronary artery was all moth eaten and diseased over too long a segment. You just can't ram in stent after stent here. And it was too far down the artery for bypass. So he was quite depressed about this. So Anne, my wife and I had him out for supper with his wife two weeks after his heart attack. Joe, come on, look, you've been eating the typical Western diet. You've got the typical Western disease. We've got 10 years of data why don't they, uh, why don't you give it a shot? He said, okay, yes, I'll do it. They really uh, couldn't offer me anything else, uh, but I'm not going to take any of those statin drugs. I don't trust them. Fine. That's your call. And he became the next two and a half years, an absolute personification of commitment 
to whole food plant-based nutrition. His total cholesterol plummeted. His LDL went from 98 down to 38. And then two and a half years after his heart attack, he had another uh, angiogram. And in the uh, surgical office areas, our doors were three door, about three doors apart. And at noontime, on the day that I knew earlier in the uh, morning he had had his follow-up angiogram, I found myself walking over to his door. I let myself in, and there was Joe sitting behind his desk. I said, Joe, look, I understand you had the follow-up angiogram earlier in the day. Could you share with me uh, how's, it, uh, how's it looking? And he got up from the desk, came around, put his arms around me, and said, I think we're doing okay. And I said, well, well is there any chance that I could perhaps see the uh, angiogram? And he said, sure. And you can see that is truly remarkable how this says uh, the body will reverse. Now, this may not happen in every patient because what, when the patient is young, as Dr. Crow was, when the patient is young and the plaque is made up of, uh, of inflammation, fat, and cholesterol, the body can do a profound job in reversing it. However, in patients who've had their blockage for decades, and the blockage is now made up of fibrosis and scar and calcification. The likelihood of it significantly being reduced is considerably less. However, what we have found is that even those patients can get back to full, out, full activity of daily living, often without any restriction. And it's gonna be my responsibility to show you how that happens before we finish today. Now, here's another example of a 45-year-old gentleman from Florida who had a heart attack in July 17th of, uh, of uh, 2017. And at the time of his heart attack, you can see his angiogram here. He had uh, in a branch of the uh, circumflex, the obtuse marshal, uh, he had an 80% blockage and, the other, and along with other blockages, his cardiologist wanted him to have bypass surgery, but he had read a book called Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease and said, no, I'm gonna try the diet. So a year later, uh, he was getting along fairly well, but the cardiologist wanted to check further on that 80% blockage, so they got another angiogram. And what was 80% was now 40%. Well, at this point, uh, he, uh, the patient changed the cardiologist, and a year and a half later, they had one final uh, angiogram and now what was what was 40 percent in uh, July of 2018 in January of 2020 it was now gone it was now gone so <clears throat> when you reflect back on this experience of this patient he actually re reversed this critical disease without any help from a single physician the physicians wanted to do bypass surgery with all due respect. Mm -hmm. Bypass surgery has nothing whatsoever to do with the causation of the illness. And it really it kind of drives home the point that really I think that it's every patient who has cardiovascular disease should at least be offered the option of reversing uh, their disease with whole food plant-based nutrition. Now, going back to our study, uh, there were, on the, uh, <clears throat> of, the, of the 18 patients who stayed with us for the full 12 years, I wanted to know oh in the eight years prior to coming into our study, while in the hands of expert cardiologists, I wanted to know how many the episodes they had of, of worsening disease. And they had these 49 events of worsening disease in the eight years prior to coming into our study, uh, listed here, as you can see, in various uh, categories. Now, on the other hand, I also wanted to see in the 12 years when they were with us, 17 of those patients had no further events. There was one little sheep who wandered from the flock at six years, got into the lamb chops and the French fries, and the glazed donuts had more angina, had a bypass operation, but now is back with the flock, but proves the point 
that I'm sharing with you today. So as, as excited I, as I was with some of the results we had from that earlier study, boy, did we take a hit. Oh, Dr. Esselstyn, your diet is too severe, too strict. It's not, it wasn't randomized. It's not large enough. What makes you think you could ever do this with a larger group and get similar results? So we did. This time, it was uh, some uh, 198 patients followed close to four years. And the amount of patients who were adherent was 89.3%, almost 90%, which is really quite st stunning, and we're quite happy with that. Uh, and I'll, you want to know how the patients do? Well, the ones that were adherent, of the 177 patients who were adherent to our program, one patient, while visiting in China, he had a tendency to have high blood pressure. He absolutely forgot all the rules, was eating off the economy, all the salt, his blood pressure spiked, he had a small stroke in his cerebellum from which he recovered. On the other hand, those uh, 21 patients who were not adherent, 62%, had disease progression. So I wanted to compare our results with some of the results that are considered the pride of, of standard cardiology. <clears throat> and if we will start on the right, there's the Lyon diet heart study with a so-called Mediterranean diet. After four years in that group, 25% had either had a heart attack, stroke, or death. We go one box to the left there, the natural history of coronary artery disease out of Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. At the end of four years, 20% heart attack, stroke, and death. And then left of that, we have Bill Bowden's Courage study, 19.4% uh, heart attack, stroke, and death after four years. So with an average overall there of about 22%, now we look at ours on the left, farthest one on the left. One patient, six tenths of 1%. Why is it there is what? Over a 30 fold difference between our results and what you see coming elsewhere. Because we are the ones that are treating the causation of the illness. Ever since the days of Hippocrates, there's been a basic covenant of trust. There's been a covenant of trust. Care, with the, care with the patient, what is the causation of the illness? And sadly today, in cardiovascular medicine, that's not being done. So let's summarize. With the diet, there is no mortality. There is no morbidity. There's no added expense you've got to eat. And the benefits will improve with time. And the, the confidence that the patients have when they understand that they never have to be waiting for the other shoe to fall. When do I get my next heart attack? Nonsense. You never have to have another heart attack. You are going to make yourself heart attack proof with whole food plant-based nutrition. Now, here is on the left is a pulse volume. And one of my patients in an earlier group in crossing the Skyway to my office had to stop five times because he had a partially blocked artery in his thigh and he had to allow his calf muscle to get enough blood to walk uh, slowly across this uh, Skyway. But I was so focused on his heart that I totally forgot about his leg until about 10 months into the study. He said, Dr. Esselstyn, do you recall when I first started seeing you, I had to stop five times crossing the Skyway uh, to the office, excuse me. Uh, and he said, uh, you know, in the last month, uh, it got to be less and it's, and now it's totally gone. I don't stop anymore. The pain is gone. And I said, well, Don, back you go to the vascular lab and we'll repeat that pulse volume study we had on you when you first started seeing us. And now you see on the right, the pulse volume had doubled, doubled. We now had absolutely irrefutable, rock solid science that food and food alone were absolutely capable of reversing 
heart disease. And somebody's going to say, well, wait a minute. What about the statin drug? Well, wait a minute. We didn't have any statin drugs then. It was 1986. And I was giving you two examples, Dr. Crow, who re refused the statin drugs, and Don, where for these patients who are unable to take a statin, they can en enjoy the same kinds of results when they adhere to whole food uh, plant-based nutrition. Here's another a gentleman. Uh, this was a 78-year-old uh, retired high school chemistry teacher who, in his retirement, he and his wife absolutely treasured uh, entering square dance contest, but it was during the fast square dance that he was getting bilateral calf pain. And so he saw the vascular surgeons and they got these images that you see here, but he wasn't too excited about the big operation they proposed for him. So he came to see us and I looked at him with a great wisdom in my face after he said, Dr. Esselstyn, how long will it take if I choose your method to get rid of this calf pain? And I said, probably about 10 months. Three months later, I got a phone call. Dr. Esselstyn, you do not speak the truth. The pain is gone. Now, I don't quite know where uh, all of you in this audience might be from, but in Cleveland, when we are watching on television, either a sporting event or a mystery, just before the announcer comes on, you may hear the mellifluous tones say something like, when the moment is right, will you be ready? Now, we all know that the penile artery is much smaller than the coronary artery to the heart. So not infrequently, before somebody comes down with heart disease, they will find that they are no longer able to uh, <clears throat> raise the flag. However, all is not lost, not infrequently. After I've counseled somebody for uh, 10 and a half months later, I uh, would get a phone call. Dr. Esselstyn, yes, this is Mr. So-and-so, sure enough. Yeah, Doc, I really thought I ought to give you a call because recently something has come up and I'm wondering if I don't owe you another check. Now, I promised before we wrap this up that we talk about what happens when you do not remove the block in the main coronary arteries and it still seems to get better. So here we are. You are looking at a PET scan. A PET scan on the left, if it is orange or yellow in the heart muscle, that is good blood perfusion. But you can see on the left, there's a patch of green, which is poor perfusion. This is in a, uh, a uh, Youngstown, Ohio school bus driver who came to us with a cholesterol of 248, and I counseled him. I counseled him on the day that he had his PET scan on the left. And then 10 days later, his cholesterol was down to 137. And three weeks later, we went ahead and we repeated the PET scan. And the area that was green is now all reperfused. How does that happen? Because you know, you, in three weeks, you'd never get, <laughs> wash out a plaque with anything, like uh, with, with food or with a with, uh, so it's striking to you, you have to ask yourself, how did the blood get there? Well, let's look at this. Uh, what you're looking at here is the heart without any muscle. You can clearly see those three large arteries that get all the publicity of stents and bypasses. Those are what we call epicardial. Epicardial is a word that means they are riding on the surface of the heart. They are readily accessible to the surgeon who wants to do bypass surgery. And they will, uh, of course, admit uh, catheters when they're doing stents. But what I want you to see is this. Where do all these arteries go? They all eventually go where they're supposed to go, which is to draw, draw, they, go, they dive into the heart muscle where they branch and branch and branch, really thousands of times as you see here. So uh, with this in mind, I called to Dr. Rodriguez, who is chairman of cardiovascular pathology at the Cleveland Clinic. And he does, uh, he probably dissects about 200 hearts a year from the deceased. And I asked Rodriguez, I said, how often, 
how often do you ever see good old standard garden variety blockage in the artery once it has dived into the heart muscle? His answer? Never. So now I have the answer because what happens when we first see these patients? As you know by now from what I've said, their endothelial tissue is absolutely ground down to minimal. So they're hardly making the strongest blood vessel dilator nitric oxide. And not only that, but when your endothelial tissue have been so injured with the diet, they are no longer, not only, they have become your enemy. And the endothelial cells are manufacturing two molecules of endothelin and thromboxane. Endothelin and thromboxane are molecules which are responsible for what we call vasoconstriction, meaning that all those thousands and thousands of interconnecting vessels that you see there in the muscle of the heart, they do not have blockage with cholesterol and plaque, but they are pinched, they're narrowed, their, their muscle is squeezing them narrower. So that entire cascade is narrowed. So literally what seems to happen, and we've seen this often, Clinic, from a clinical standpoint, as soon as we get one of these patients who has, let's say, frequent angina, whenever they effort, they get chest pain with effort, they change their diet. The endothelial cells start making more of the greatest vessel dilatation, nitric oxide, and the endothelial cells stop making, stop making any of those vasoconstrictors, endothelin and thromboxane. So literally what happens, that each entire enormous intramuscular area of blood vessels widens and opens up, which explains why it is that these patients so quickly can get rid of their chest pain uh, and their angina. And finally, the uh, eight measures of disease reversal, we mentioned it, I showed you it on the angiogram, you see it on the stress test. We talked about reversal of the PET scan the carotid ultrasound, it shows the reversal of the artery in the neck, the pulse volume, reversal of the artery disease in the leg. And then of course, you can eliminate the symptoms of chest pain and claudication and erectile dysfunction. Uh, just to let you know where I worked for many years on the eighth floor as a surgeon in this A building at the Cleveland Clinic, but I also like to show it to those of you who don't get to Cleveland, so because I'd like you to see what the uh, trees look like in February, right? <laughs> uh, now, that's where I, once I retired from surgery, I was hired to work at the Wellness Institute. And although the budget is more modest, the morale is quite high. And one thing I've learned after 60 years of having left medical school, while brains are important, nothing is as important perhaps as persistence, 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 best exemplified by this young damsel in Life Magazine in 1939, trying and trying and trying to learn how to do the splits. And it is tough, tough to learn how to do the splits, but she stuck with it. And the other day in downtown Cleveland, somebody spotted her and she had got it right. 